Good morning, everybody. Don't you guys stand? Yeah, I don't know what that was. You guys sleeping? Is everyone awake? All right.
brothers and sisters, come and be healed. Oh, come, come to the water, all who are thirsty, come and be filled. Oh, come, come to the
Jeremy, can you go back to like the third verse? Like I wanna focus just on that real quick. This right here. It says, Lord, I've been told to be ashamed. Lord, I've been told I don't measure up. Lord, I've been told I'm not good enough. But you're here with me. Like that verse just resonates in my soul, man. Because the world will tell you, man, you're not good enough. You could screw up so many times, so many times. And people will like, hey, like, that's it, man. You're done. You're never, you're never going to come back. But that's the beautiful thing about our Savior is that he's here with open arms. And he says, you're here with me. And we can say that. And then I, I like at the end, it says, I will rejoice in the simple gospel. And no matter, we, we complicate the gospel. As human beings, we complicate it. We read these verses and we're like, well, what about this? And what about that? And what about this? It's straightforward. Jesus loves you. He died on the cross for the sins of everyone. That's it. And if you have a relationship with him, you get to spend eternity in a place that is so perfect. This world is a mess. We can all agree. Imagine going to a place where that is no more. Imagine rejoicing with our brothers and sisters in heaven for all of eternity. We could do a whole sermon on these songs. I've thought about it over and over again because I, 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 I sing these songs all the time, obviously. I listen to them. And if you break down each one of these songs, the gospel is there. And it's so simple. Jesus loves you. He's there with open arms saying, come, my child. I am here with you. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this morning. And Father, we thank you for songs just like this one that remind us of how simple the gospel is. No matter how many times we try to complicate it, God, we know you're here. We know that you're among us. And Father, I pray that we would feel that. We would see uh, through your word that you're here. And we would see the never-ending love that you have for every, sing every single person in this room. And God, we just lift you up. God, we lift Pastor Frank up to you this morning. We just pray that you would speak through him, that we would see your gospel for what it is. And we love you so much. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, I was uh, reading an article the other day by an expert. He was talking about how to give a good sermon. And he said, never start your sermon by reading scripture. So in honor of that expert that doesn't know what he's talking about, Let's start off by reading scripture this morning. We're studying the book of 1 John, and we left off at verse 11, chapter 3. John, inspired by the Holy Spirit, writes, For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. Well, it's no secret if you've been with us studying the book of 1 John that uh, this book is about true salvation. 
Jesus himself talked about how many people who say they believe don't believe with their heart. And that's just what John is echoing throughout the book. He's looking at it from every angle. Not everybody that says they're a Christian is a Christian. I heard the story of a family. They went to one of these churches that christened babies. And uh, they went to the service. The baby was christened. And they got into the car. And the, the oldest boy that was there witnessing the, the little baby being christened began to cry. And so his mom and dad looked back and said, hey, hey, buddy, what's wrong? And he said, well, mommy and daddy, the priest said that uh, he wanted us kids to live in a Christian home, but we want to stay with you guys. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, kids, kids can see it, can't they? Kids see how we talk. Kids see how we act. They know what we're really about. And of course, God sees every thought in our mind, every motive of our heart. Tina Turner, in her famous song, asked the question, what's love got to do with it? And John here, in the passage that we looked at, says when it comes to eternal life, love has everything to do with it. It's not a sentimental love. It's not a we condone everything kind of love. It's a real love that comes from God from the heart. It's that Greek word agape love where it's self-sacrifice. I will, I will die to myself. I will lay my life down for the sake of my brother and my sister. So let's look at this. Uh, I want to make three points from these verses we read. Number one, simply, let's look at the message of love. Verse 11. He says, For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. And that, that we should love one another is, John's not saying this is merely our duty. He's saying that, that this shows if we're genuine or not. It, it, it automatically pours out of our life. That comes with becoming a Christian. That comes with God putting his spirit inside of you. You know, I, I talk about it a lot, but people do say, they, they kind of think that the Old Testament is different than the New Testament. They don't go together. And it's kind of like, Love, love is a new thing, but John is saying, no, it, th this has been the message from the beginning. And the idea in the Greek is it's the most important message you have heard from the beginning. Hebrews 13.8 says this, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. It's talking about his character. God's character never changes. God is, at, is, has, is absolutely the same in eternity past, and he will be the same in eternity future. Yes, God's methods have changed. He's doing different things through the church than he did with Israel. He's even doing different things with the church than he did with the apostles. But it was all according to God's same plan, but the message has always been love. When they asked Jesus what the greatest commandment was, he said, love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus was quoting the Old Testament law. So it's not something new. It's something that, that God has always wanted. And what John has been telling us that when we become Christians and God's seed is in us, he talked about last week, the spirit of God, the life of God, we are no longer dominated by sin. Yes, we struggle with sin. We talked about it last week. Yes, we struggle to shut our cell phones off, okay? It, it, it just happens. And we struggle with these things, but we're not dominated by it. John says we don't practice it. 
We're not practicing sin. We're running away from it. And now that he comes to this message on love, it's the same thing. Yes, sometimes we, we struggle to love the people right in front of us, even in the church. We struggle to forgive them. We struggle with what we know God has called us to do. But here's the deal. In the end, God, the God side of us will always win. We will find a way to forgive. We'll pray until we get there. We'll, we, we, will, we will do whatever it takes to find a way to love God and to love our brother and sister. Romans 12, 9 says, Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Our love needs to be genuine. It can't just be words. And I love that. Then he says, Abhor what is evil. Hate what is evil. And... Uh, <laughs> When we talk about love and we talk about hate, I think some people think there's something wrong with that word hate. But we find in Scripture that God hates evil. God hates pride. That comes with being loving. God's character, he is love. Therefore, he, he hates what is evil. So that comes with it. Uh, we always say we, we, we love the sinner, but we hate the sin. And that, that is because of love, because we hate what that sin is doing to someone. And so, Christians, our love has to be genuine. Number two, he talks about the murder of love. He gives an extreme example. Verse 12 we should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Cain. Cain murdered his opportunity of being loving toward his brother. And he literally killed him. Now we find that story in Genesis chapter 4, and I want to tell it to you because I know there's some of you that possibly have never heard that story. It's a very interesting story in the Bible. I would encourage you to read through the Bible. It's an interesting story because, number one, it's the first death in the Bible. It's the first actual death that takes place when Cain murders Abel. It's really the first martyr in the Bible. Because Abel was murdered because of his testimony of doing what God wanted and bringing the proper sacrifice. Um, you might have understood that story wrong. I know when I first heard it, I understood it wrong. And I don't know if it was just my understanding of it or the way people explained it to me. But the scripture tells us that Abel... He took care of animals. He was a farmer that took care of the livestock and the animals. Cain was a farmer, and his expertise was growing crops, growing fruit, and growing vegetables. Both are needed. But when it came time to give a sacrifice to God, Abel brought a blood sacrifice. He brought, he brought an animal sacrifice to give to the Lord. Cain brought, of course, fruit and vegetables because that's what Cain did. Now, I always heard the story that, that the reason why God rejected Cain and he accepted Abel was because Abel gave his best. And I heard that Cain did not give his best. But the truth is this. Cain did bring his best. And that's why his offering was rejected. 
because Cain's best was not good enough. Abel wasn't trusting in his best. Abel was trusting in God's best. See, we're not here today to to praise ourselves because of our best. We're going to take communion and we're going to remember Christ. We have faith in God's best and what his best is for us. You see... Cain and Abel were instructed that God preferred blood sacrifices. And you say, well, well, where does it say that? How would they know that? Well, they would learn that from their parents, Adam and Eve. Because you see, Adam and Eve, when they sinned, they tried to cover up their own sin. Remember with the fig leaves? But God showed up. Jesus showed up in in an angelic human body, the angel of the Lord. And what did Jesus do? Jesus sacrificed an animal and he clothed Adam and Eve in animal skins. God also prophesied to Adam and Eve that he would send someone through Eve, through the woman. A man would be born that would crush Satan's head. And then along with that sacrifice, that sacrifice would point to the cross that would come in the future. So you see, Abel was looking forward to Jesus. He was looking forward to God's best. Cain said, no, I can give my best. Uh, My best is good enough. And God, of course, rejected Cain's offering. And it is still the same today. There are people who think, well, I'll just give my best. But your best is not good enough. Only God's best and that sacrifice of Jesus Christ can give you access to God and give you access to eternal life. And Cain got angry. Cain got angry, and the Scripture tells us that he attacked his brother and he killed him. Murder, murder is is the lowest level, okay, when you're talking about the opposite of love. And so Cain was a a murderer of love because his deeds were evil. And again, it it just, it kind of shows that hatred even from the beginning is what we see in our world. And we see a hatred toward Jesus Christ. We we, we get a hatred. I mean, hey, when I, I talk to people a lot and when I say, hey, your best is not good enough, they get angry. But that is the gospel truth. And so it just is God's truth, and there's only one way, and it's through the sacrifice of Jesus. Notice verse 13. He says, Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Don't be surprised, brothers and sisters, when the world hates you. Don't be surprised when family members turn against you because of your faith in Christ. Don't be surprised when people at your work, when they find out you're a Christian, that they do not like you, and they even might persecute you. That comes with being a Christian. I mean, thank God. I mean, you know, the hatred toward Christianity in America is somewhat veiled. It's somewhat shackled because of laws. But we see in other countries where, where there aren't laws and we see Christians and we see brothers and sisters all over the world more than ever today are being persecuted and killed for their faith. But the Holy Spirit says, don't be surprised. Jesus clearly said, if they hated me, they are going to hate you. The Apostle Paul said, anybody 
who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. If you've never been persecuted, it's because you're not living a godly life. Because if you live a godly life, somehow, some way, somebody is going to persecute you and attack you for your faith in Jesus. Especially when you start saying Jesus is the only way. And so John is saying, we know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. He's saying, do you you want to know if you're a true Christian or not? This is how you know if you pass from death to life, if you love your brothers and your sisters in Christ. Before, before I was a Christian, I had no desire to be around church people. I had no desire at all whatsoever to hang out with the church crowd. But something happened when I became a believer that was the crowd that drew that I was drawn to. That was the bond I had with the people that believed in Christ just the way I did. There's an incredible bond when you truly love Christ and you get around the people of God that believe the same way you do. And that's why even with all of our differences in all of our ways of thinking and all of our ways of being brought up, that, that we can come together and worship together and really have a genuine love for one another. And not just sentimental, not just a feeling, but if we really see a brother or sister hurting, we can't help but pray for them. We can't help to try to find a way we can sacrifice and help them in some way. That comes with being a Christian. But whoever does not love, he says, abides in death. And when you hate your brother, you hate your sister. And nobody here and nobody in the world is going to say that they hate somebody. They're not going to say it. They're going to, oh, no, I don't hate them. I just don't like it. You know, because they're scared to be honest. And the point is this, what John is saying, it's not what you say. It's how you live your life. It's really what's in your heart. It's really what motivates you to be the person you are and do what you do. So so John is saying, you know, look at your life. Look at how do you love other Christians? What have you done? What are you willing to do for other Christians? So I wanted to say, because John does say, no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. And I want to say to you, it does not mean murder cannot be forgiven. I told you last week, we talked about King David who had the affair and put Bathsheba's husband on the front line. I mean, that was a form of murder. And David is is in heaven as we speak. The Apostle Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, took part in killing and persecuting Christians before Jesus came into his life. And you see the transformation in Paul. You see how Paul went from persecuting Christians and even being a part of killing Christians to become a man of God that wrote Scripture through the Holy Spirit that tells us that we are to love Christians. That was the difference, see? It's the transformation of the heart. So murder can be forgiven. And you need to understand this. There are going to be people in heaven that have literally committed the act of murder. But there are going to be people, there are going to be people in hell who've never committed the act of murder. They've never pulled the trigger. They never stab with a knife because murder was in their heart even though they never committed the act. Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, says this. 
you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. That's scary. So Jesus is saying, see, see, God looks at the heart. Yes, there are different consequences for sin. If somebody pulls out in front of you and you call them an idiot, you call them a fool, that's kind of hatred in your heart, but you're not going to go to prison for that. Now, if you speed up and slam on your brakes and get out and shoot the guy in the head, you're going to go to prison. There's different consequences. But what you've got to understand, what Jesus is saying is, in the hum- God looks at the human heart. And when God looks at a human heart and that person has hatred in the heart, and that person insults the person in their mind or, or with their mouth or calls somebody their name or hates that brother, that person really, if put, here's the truth, if put in the right spot, if put in the right situation, that person will commit murder. And so really, the truth is we're all born. We're all born sinners, and therefore we're all born with hatred in our hearts, murderous thoughts. And depending on the situation in life that you're put in, how you would go about it and how you would carry it out. But Jesus' point here in the Sermon on the Mount was to try to show the religious people of the day, you keep saying you've never done this. And people say it today, well, I've never committed murder. And I've never done this. And I've never done that. But the point is, God is looking at the heart. And so we all need a Savior. That's it. We've got to come to God and we've got to say, God, I I have sin in my heart. I have hate in my heart. And I need you to save me. And when Christ comes into our heart, yes, he forgives all of our hatred. He forgives our murderous thoughts. He forgives our name calling and, and, and all that we do. But he also transforms us. And therefore, we should be running away from that type of hatred. You should be able to look at your life and see that you're a different person, that you don't say what you used to say about people. And you do find yourself loving people. And you're not dominated like you were by your anger and by your hatred. Because John is saying, if you're dominated by hatred, if you're dominated by anger, then eternal life is not in you. So we must all examine ourselves in these things. Galatians 6.10 says this. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. As Christians, as Christians, we should try to do good to everyone, okay? Who is everyone? Everyone. (laughs) The best we can. Scripture says, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone because sometimes that person doesn't want to have peace even though you're trying to have peace. So as far as it depends on you, you, you're the one that tries to be the peacemaker. You're you're the one that tries to do good. Uh, You know, Jesus, they ask Jesus, well, you know, the smart Alex says, well, who's my neighbor? You know, so Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan about how the guys left you know, beaten up dead in the road, and the religious guy, the two religious guys come by, and they ain't got time to help. But a Samaritan comes by, who everybody hated in that day, and he helped the man. And he picked him up, and he sacrificed to stop, and to pick him up, and to go and took him and paid, paid for him to, to get healing and to be taken care of. And Jesus says, that man was the true neighbor. That that man that saw the need right in front of him, he was the one 
showing love. But it's funny because the religious guys would not stop, but they, they just thought they were so important. And they thought they, they thought they were so much better than the guy lying in the road. Who are they to stop and help? This is the way people thought. And we've got to make sure that we're genuine. And when we see that need in front of us that we help, and we see that in the final point here, we're going to talk about the model of love. We talk about the model of love, and of course the model of love is Jesus, who we're about to take communion and remember that love that he gave to us on the cross. Verse 16 says, By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. We know, we studied the Gospel of Mark, Jesus literally laid his life down. Nobody took his life from him. I don't even think we can call Jesus a martyr because Jesus planned his own death. He came and willingly laid his life down. They could not take his life if he didn't want to. But he willingly left the glories of heaven is, is the point. He left all of that and made that sacrifice to come and identify with us human beings, took on a human body and lived a life of suffering and just dealt with the ignorance of people and the sin of people. And this holy God took on a human body to come to lay his life down. And John is saying, if that same Jesus truly lives inside of you, then you've got to be willing to lay your life down for your brothers. You've got to be willing to sacrifice. You've got to come out of your comfort zone and get involved and find people. That's why, hey, church membership starts Wednesday night. That's why church membership's important, because church membership keeps you accountable from loving God. It, get, it helps you, keeps you accountable to loving people and being with the people of God that God screams that he wants and that it pleases him. And this is what true Christians do. Verse 17, but if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need yet closes his heart against him. How does the love of God abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and truth. John says, how can you call yourself a Christian and you have worldly goods? God has blessed you with income. God has blessed you with stuff, with money. And if God has blessed you in that way, how can you see somebody right in front of you that has, has a need and you not want to help them? And I think the answer is this, is because people think, people, people, the more successful you are, the more money you have, the more you start thinking how much better you are than everybody. And see, the person that doesn't have as much as you, it's because they haven't worked as hard as you. It's because they're lazy. It's because they're stupid, see. But you're so wonderful and you're so good, see, that they deserve to be in the suffering or the predicament they're in. And I want to tell you something, that is evil way of thinking. And many, many people think that way and John is saying if you think that way there's no way that God can truly be living in you you might go to church you might own a Bible you might tell people that you're a Christian but if it's not in your heart and, and what he's saying to meet that need right in front of you John says little children Let's not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. Let's just not, let's don't say amen today. But then go right out and still live the way we live. 
You know, I, I can't help but think of that there's so much hypocrisy when it comes to this. We, we saw in the Gospels, when we go through the Gospels, you see where Mary of Bethany pours this expensive amount of perfume on Jesus to worship him. And Judas Iscariot, Judas, the ultimate hypocrite, says that money should have been given to the poor. And it sounds so good, doesn't it? But the Holy Spirit then writes us the reason why Judas said that is because he was stealing money from the other disciples' bag. He, he was stealing money from the money bag for himself. But he said something that sounded so religious and so good. Man, this money should have been given to the poor. Do you know how many people say, you know, the church should be helping the poor and they never lift a finger to help anyone? There are people that say, the government, the government should be helping the poor. And the person that says that never, never, ever lifts one finger to help the poor. They're able to say it and it makes them feel good that they say it. You know, uh, they're in the in the political world out there. There's big arguments. You know, you look at an argument like uh, the border crisis, right? You got the border, and everybody. Some people want to secure a strong border, build a wall. Other people are like, no, just let everybody in, right? And so there's a big debate and big arguments about it. And obviously, there has to be some kind of balance, obviously. But I will tell you, the people that say let everybody in, those same people. They lock their doors at night, and they ain't letting anybody in. Hmm. And, and this is what I'm saying. In, in the world, it, it's just hypocrisy. It's hypocrisy saying, yeah, we should be doing this. We should be helping this. But then nobody lifts a finger. And, and what John is saying, what John is saying, okay, that's going to continue to happen. That's the world, and that's the way the world is. And the, and the world will always be that way until Jesus returns and fixes it because government ain't going to fix it. No president's going to fix it. It's not going to be fixed until Jesus comes and transforms this world. And the only people there are people with transformed hearts. And we won't have to lock our doors at night ever again. We won't have to worry about a border crisis because the Lord will come back. But until then... The people of God, the church, those of us that call ourselves Christian, we must be willing to meet the need right in front of us. There's no way, there's no way that we could solve the poverty problem in our world today. There's no way to solve it. It's unlimited. There's no way to solve the homeless situation in our town or in any city in America, there is no way to solve it. It is absolutely unlimited. There is no way to feed every person out of work in Port Charlotte or, or every person struggling with some kind of health issue. There's no way to meet every single need. It's unlimited. but we can meet the need right in front of us today. That's what we're responsible for. If we see there's a need in our church, we need to meet that need. If you have a need right in front of you in your neighborhood, in your family, that's what you're responsible for then. And so God is calling us to be people of love. And it's all, remember, it's all motivated by the love that Jesus gave to us. And that should be in our heart to love others. Would you bow and pray with me this morning? Men are gonna come. We're gonna pass out communion and remember Jesus and worship him. I pray in this moment, as we have a time of prayer, that you would examine your heart. You examine your heart. 
You know, are you, are you more known by your talk? Or are you more known by your actions? Agape love that the Bible talks about is always action. Our words have, we have to practice what we preach. So may God convict us in our weak areas. May, may like last week, may God help us, help us to overcome sin. And now this week, may God help us to be more loving, to be more aware of it, to not be so distracted by our own selfishness and our own little world. May we come out of that comfort zone and pray and look for that need that we could meet today. And may God be glorified for it. Father God, thank you for your holiness and your love. God, thank you that you've been loving from the beginning. Your character is love. But we do thank you that you're holy, God, and you do hate sin. You hate evil. You hate it because of what it does to the people you created. God, help us to be like you. Help us, help us to love people at the same time. Hate the evil. Lord, help us to be like Jesus, that it was so balanced. He's so, he's able to stand against evil, but at the same time be so loving and gracious. I pray, Father, that our church would be different. God, I pray that, that, that people would see a difference in us, that they would see that we're genuine. Know, God, that, that we don't claim to be perfect. We don't claim to be better than anybody else. God, that we know we're only saved by grace. But God, I pray that people would see because of that grace that it just our hearts overflow with an overwhelming love. Lord, I know how much you love the church. You died to create the church. And I pray, God, that you would give us a love for that church. And God, as I said, that the needs are unlimited in this world, but God, we can, we can meet the needs in front of us. We can love each other here. I pray that you would help us to do that, God, and we would be real. Thank you for the opportunities you give us to serve and to worship you. God, now as we take these emblems, we pray that you'd be pleased, God. Pray that there would be an aroma that comes up to you, pleasing to you that our hearts are in love with you and our hearts are thankful because of the grace you've given us. We thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Men are going to pass out. The cup comes with bread at the bottom and, and the juice. Just hold on to that, okay? Be in a prayerful mode and then I'll come out and we'll take it together as a church body.
So, of course, we take the bread to remember Jesus' body that was put on that cross. Jesus asked us to remember him and to remember the love that he gave us. Let's remember. Let's take the, the bread together. And then he took the cup and he said, this is the blood of my covenant. It's a covenant that gives us peace with God. He shed his blood in our place. You know, the scripture says that the heavens declare the glory of God. When we look at the heavens and the stars and all of God's creation and the, and the unique animals and all of God's creation, it shows us the glory of God. But the cross of Jesus Christ, Christ declares the love of God. And that cross screams that I love you. And Jesus said, I shed my bl blood on your behalf. <clears throat> Let's take together. Let's thank him together. Lord, thank you that we can come. We can come and worship. Lord, I pray we'd never grow tired of coming to your house on Sunday. We'd never grow tired of your scriptures. I pray that communion would never grow old to us, Lord. I pray that each time our hearts would be stirred. When we think of the magnitude of it, that God, you would leave heaven and come here for sinners like us. While we were yet sinners. And God, I pray, continuing on with our scriptures, Lord, because you demonstrated this great love to us, that God, even a little bit, even a little bit, we'll never, ever reach that magnitude. But if we could just go in that direction a little bit and be willing to, to sacrifice, to lay our life down for somebody else, to reach out a helping hand. And God, I, God, not that we would do that because it's our duty, but I pray that it would just be in our hearts. And, and when we do these things, we would be filled with joy. So we ask you to make our hearts genuine today. We thank you for this service. We thank you that we could sing these songs. Praise your name. We thank you that we could open your word and listen and have ears to hear. We thank you for communion, Lord, and what it means. May we take this with us as we leave today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand. Let's worship one final time before we close.
Last day to sign up for softball, so make sure you sign up for that. And we sure would love to see you uh, this Wednesday night at 6.30. Just for four weeks, we're going to go over church membership, every little detail. I promise it's going to be interesting. It's going to be exciting. So we hope you make plans to be there uh, this Wednesday night. I want to thank you for praying for my family. You know, one of the joys, one of, the joys of being a, a pastor is the congregation prays for you. And I want you to know, I feel your prayers. I feel your prayers. And my fourth grandson was born just the other day. Little guy, he's awesome. And I didn't take part in the birth. I just saw the baby, but I'm tired, man. I'm tired. <laughs> just seeing it makes me tired, all right? So, but that little, little Easton is here. Easton's a good name, you know. Easton, some of you sports guys, Easton is a baseball bat, you know, Easton. And that's because uh, Michael and Brittany met because of baseball and a billboard, and so they named him Little Easton. So it's a, it's, a, it's a good name with some meaning. Actually, God did it, not the billboard and the baseball, but, <laughs> but it's a good name. It's a good name, okay? Thank you for your prayers. Let me pray for you, and then we'll, we'll let you go. Father, bless these people. God, bless these people who came to worship you. Go with them. God, answer their prayers. As they pray for me, God, I, I pray their prayers go right back at them. And you bless them and take care of their families and their life. Lord, help us to get through this hard life. Help us all together, loving one another, to stay focused on you. Thank you for the great love you've given us. Help us to love others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Hope to see you Wednesday. <laughs>